The Baltimore Ravens have constructed a complete team, and as they exit their bye week, we reflect on just how they did it. We talk about that and so much more coming up next here on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, where your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, here with you on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, thank you so much for being here today, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day, free and available all podcasting platforms, including over in video form on YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. The Ravens. Exit their bye week. They're a nine and three football team tied for the top spot in the AFC conference. We have a very special guest to help us break this whole entire roster, how they got there down today. It's Pete Gilbert of WBAL. Pete, I appreciate you hopping on. I'm glad we're finally able to connect and do this. And I'm glad we're able to do it under the circumstances where the Ravens are tied for that top spot in the conference. It's funny. I, you feel like you know somebody because you've engaged with them, follow them on Twitter for, you know, or X or whatever we're supposed to call it now uh, for quite some time. And and it's nice to actually have a face to face conversation with you. So uh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you hopping on. And I see you got the Christmas tree with the lights going on in the background. And since it's it's, it's December, I think it's appropriate. And I asked the question on the Friday show because that was December 1st. But you see the Christmas music and the holiday decorations. Sometimes it comes out a bit earlier than December. You, you know, you got the uh, before Halloween, before Thanksgiving. Where are you in that in, in the conversation? Is Christmas music allowed before December or is it December 1st and then it's allowed? So we go Black Friday. That's become okay. our tradition uh, to put up the – that's when we – it's – with my schedule – and where my wife and kids, that, that's a day that generally works for all of us to be able to do it together. Sure. And that's, as you know, when you, in this business, you never quite know all the time, but at least we know it's always that Friday. Right. And I've got, well, I don't have to be at work until three o'clock. So we have that morning and early afternoon to go ahead and put things up. And this is actually just, this is my wife's location. She works from home in the basement here and she has a little tree with some lights on it. This isn't the main, this isn't the main deal, but that's okay. We're uh, but we, it's a nice little cozy spot down here. It is. And I, you know, sometimes you go to like the targets or the home goods, they have Christmas deck and that little section, it starts to grow at, at Halloween, Thanksgiving, but now we're in December. So we can actually say <laughs> we can put the Christmas stuff up a hundred percent, but December is a big month for the Ravens, Pete, because it's the it's the gauntlet of their schedule. They have five games coming up, coming out of this bye, toughest schedule in the league. But I think Baltimore's put themselves in a good position, which we'll get to over the course of the show. But look, I think we have to kind of reflect here on this roster because there were some signings, especially late, that people weren't so sure about, such as Jadavian Clowney, Arthur Millette, some of those guys. And no roster in the NFL is perfect. You know, the Ravens still have holes, but... Every team does, and it's a team that I think has a lot of depth this season. And we see guys like Clowney, Millette, Kyle Van Noy, these guys who were sitting on their couches two weeks before the season or during the year step up for them. So when you see this team is 9-3 and three, and you look back at the questions that were being asked before the season, I think those have been answered in a pretty big way. Yeah, I mean, as we have for the last several years, ever since really Terrell Suggs in, what, 2017, who's going to get after the quarterback? And, you know, what's the pass rush going to be? And here they are heading into week 14, leading the NFL in sacks. So and they, they've answered that in a huge way, but not answered it due in one avenue. You know, you have the blitzes. You know, you you look at Kyle Hamilton having three sacks in one game on blitzes. Uh, Arthur Millette coming off the edge likewise in creative ways to, to get home. And then Clowney and Van Noy and Matt Abike with 10. When was the last time they had an interior pass rush? like this. I mean, I, I don't know that they ever have had anything quite like it. I mean, Calais obviously was, but we didn't have him in his prime. So I just don't think, I mean, that to, when you combine that, when that pocket collapses from the middle in, that's a real problem for quarterbacks. You just can't step up. And then you have quality guys on the edge, Adafe and, and Clowney and Van Noy uh, coming after him. 
And it's really, uh, it's, it's a great recipe for causing, putting stress on the quarterbacks. And really that's what you want to do. The sacks have come along with it, but ultimately you want to stress the quarterback and force them into mistakes. And they've been able to do that as well as they've done it. And I, mean, I was talking with Keith Mills about it last night on our show. Is this the best since 2006 uh, collectively? And it, you know, the, on the defensive effort, and it just might be. Yeah, and you speak about 2006. Matabike is the first interior defensive lineman to have double-digit sacks since Trevor Price did it back in 2006. Terrell Suggs, first double-digit sack player since 2017, Matabike is. But the pass rush, I think it's been a question because – Everybody was asking, well, we know they can blitz, but can they get consistent pressure with rushing four and not having to send extra guys? And I mean, the luxury of having this defense is you, now you can do both because you have Matabike. When he wins, he wins hard. He doesn't win every time, but when he does, you mentioned the pocket collapsing and they, they're just a physical defense. I've mentioned the kind of the trade out they did with Marcus Peters and Rocky Yassin. Part of the reason they did it, even though Yassin really hasn't played a lot this season, was because yes, seen as a physical corner, and I think for Marcus Peters, that's not his mo. And look, he did a lot of great things with Baltimore. He's he's available now if they want to kick the tires again. Good. Yeah, Good. I, I personally wouldn't. I, I wouldn't do that either. But when you talk you about need right now, no, and that's there, Brandon Stevens has stepped up. Yeah. Or let they have those corners, which have done a great job. Right. So the pass rush has been, as we talk about, as as good as it's been in quite some time. There were a lot of questions about you know what their, their ability to cover and. What Brandon Stevens has done is play at a Pro Bowl level. And, I mean, the stats in terms of picks aren't there, but he is a blanket. And it's a great reminder, to the you know, because the first couple of years, kind of like, ah, he was a third-round pick. You expect, you know, by year two, he should be impactful. You hoped so. Right. That really wasn't the case. But what, it, what it's come down to is this guy was a running back from at UCLA, makes a transfer, tra not just schools but positions, and then – it becomes, you know, it's just, there's so much nuance to the position. There's so many things you have to get through reps. And when you haven't had those reps, it's just going to take time. But now you see when he's had them, holy cow. I mean, he just, he is locked down. And then, you know, you're, you're going to get, you know, Marlon back this week. Yassine has been okay, but it's been Darby, again, a late signee who has really taken over at the other outside corner spot and done a really good job. And I think when you when you see all these different pieces that came in and so many of them coming in late, for it to be this good, you have to credit Mike McDonald. I mean, to be able to really, and, and Chris Hewitt, to really figure out how to get everyone to buy in and understand their role and stick to that role. You don't have the freelancing that led to gaping holes in the, in the second guys running free. We haven't seen that this year. I also will point out through nine or through 12 games and nine wins, they, who are the real prolific offenses they've faced? Eh, not really that much. They will find out shortly. Not that it'll be decent this week with the Rams. Not great, but these, there's some good, you know, and Puka and, and Cooper are, are a problem for sure. But, you know, when you think about dealing with the Dolphins who have come in there and obviously been successful, uh, watching Debo Samuels destroy a decent Philadelphia defense almost single-handedly, uh, it's the challenges, the toughest challenges are yet to come. And so it'll be, I, you know, the defining through 12, it's a little hard. So we'll, we'll get to 17 and, have, and really know just how good this defense was. Yeah, and I know that it's almost like a sandwich because you mentioned the Rams. They're, they're a good test. Again, not one of the top, top offenses, but I think they're a sneaky underrated one. But then it's that stretch of Jacksonville, San Francisco, and Miami, which is going to be the big one. Then Pittsburgh, Mike Tomlin has his voodoo magic going. <laughs> Who knows if Kenny Pickett will be back at this at that point. But they always just seem to be in the games. Well, not yet. Yesterday did not seem like they were in that one whatsoever. But it's really interesting because you mentioned the Brandon Stevens thing. And I won't lie, Pete, I was a little nervous about the Ravens, how they handled him a bit early on. Because you see guys like Isaiah Simmons in Arizona, Zayvon Collins in Arizona. Those guys moved all around the field those first couple of years. And I know John Harbaugh's talked about this and some of the other coaches have too, where if you move a guy around a lot, you just want to have him settle in and learn a position. And the, the Ravens, they brought him in. He came from SMU as a corner. You mentioned his running back history also at UCLA. But they moved him to safety his first year. And then he moves back to corner his second year. They were going to move him back to safety this year, but then they had so many injuries at corner. They said, we have to move you back. And it was a blessing in disguise because it ended up, you know, he's been their shut down guy and he stepped up 
with Marlon being out those two games against the Bengals, Marlon Humphrey list defenses, Jamar Chase gets held to seven receptions for 40 yards. And that, it, it was a garbage. He has the one touchdown, but it was with 50 seconds left in the game. The game was over at that point, but being nervous about a couple of things, I think I was a little more nervous about the corner position entering the year than I am now, but you talked about Mike McDonald. Are you a little nervous that he's going to start getting head coaching looks? Uh, he will get looks. There, there's no doubt about it. What I think the conversations I've had with Mike and we've had we've been able to talk a few times just in a more of a casual setting and not in a press conference kind of thing. And he is a very thoughtful. He's very mature. You know, he's young, but you would think you're talking to a guy 45 or 50. I feel like a contemporary uh, of mine. And yet he's I'm 20. I could I'm not, I guess I could be his dad technically, but <laughs> Let's not go down that road. Um, you know, you feel like you're talking to someone, you know, that's about your age. And it's remarkable because clearly he's very young and but he's so smart and he he understands his strengths. He understands his weaknesses and is not. And that's I mean, what that's the great. I mean, when you think about someone at that age to know that to be had the ability to see that and be willing to ask the questions and get help and not be afraid. Uh, so many times you see a young coach in a high level position early on. And what do they do? They say, I know everything. I got this. No, I'm here because I know. Well, no, that's not the way he goes about it. And he was humbled a little bit last year, but continued to learn and go with it. Didn't get rattled, but I understood that he, there were things he didn't know and had to learn and to watch him grow. So he's going to get looks, but he's also, he's not going to take just the first opportunity that comes open. He, he wouldn't go to a spot if it wasn't a good spot for him. So, you know, it's in most of the jobs that come open are open because they aren't great places to be. You know, you know, most you know, there are a few that, that turn up that, you know, annually one or two that are, no, that's a good place to go. You can go win there. So I think that he will be picky and he's not in a rush and he knows that he hasn't done this very long. And that's going where the knowledge, I think, you know, will at least he's going to go it's because the absolute right situation came to him he's not necessarily going to go seek it out yeah and i think if you want another example of a young coach who maybe didn't take an opportunity just because it was there ben johnson the offensive coordinator for the lions had options last year but he decided he wanted to go back to detroit and now it seems like he's ready to make that jump so maybe he wants to stay and kind of finish it out if they don't get as far as they want to or Maybe he just feels like Baltimore is the right place for him and he's going to be picky. And I think he should be because he's earned that. And I think he will get looks too, but we'll see what that whole situation. We're coming up in the second part of the show. We'll be getting into the roster a little bit more and also talking about the Ravens division and conference outlooks as they exit their bias. So be sure to stay tuned, plan to talk about Unlocked on Ravens. First, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. And I've had so many frustrating ticket buy experiences in my life. Sometimes, again, I couldn't, Really see if the seats were good, couldn't find last minute tickets, and sometimes there are just no good deals whatsoever. But you shouldn't have to worry about that when you're buying tickets to your next big event because Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with Carol last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And the Game Time app has a ton of great events, especially in the Baltimore area. The Ravens return to MT Bank Stadium, play the Los Angeles Rams in week 14, plus plenty of concerts as well. And the app has last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, views from all the seats in the venue, and things like lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, and more. Game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can buy tickets in seconds with two taps, and they're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on your tickets. With zone deals, you pick the section, and game time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings. Get the ghost out of buying tickets with game time down the game time app. Create an account and use code Lockdown NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Again, terms apply. Create an account, redeem code Lockdown NFL, spelled L O C K E D O N NFL for $20 off. Download game time's last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. We're back. Our second seven locked on Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here with Pete Gilbert. And Pete, I want to round out our roster conversation from the first part of the show because I feel like Baltimore is constructed really a complete roster all the way around again. Not saying they don't have holes. I mentioned that in the first segment. But do you think this is the most complete roster in the NFL right now? I love what San Francisco's built. I love what Philadelphia's built. There are a couple contenders. You look in the AFC, the Chiefs. I have questions about the wide receiver group over there. Miami, I know the conversation in Miami is who have they beaten, right? That, that's kind of the conversation there. And Jacksonville is also in the thick of the conversation. But how would you kind of stack what Baltimore and Eric DaCosta has built up against the rest of the league? It's probably as complete uh, a, a roster as he's had um, 
since 2019. And the receiving core wasn't as good then, but because Lamar was so new and so unknown, you know, he could throw for 37 touchdown passes with that receiving core. And it was a great defense too. And it had the offensive line. It was just, it, it had all come together at that. But I thought when you, when you think about the way they've addressed their needs and the way that the, the draft class, you know, from 2020 and 2021, the, it's it's really hit, and they're they're built so well through the draft. They get their cornerstones there, and that and and that's so important. And if you go, and then they've supplemented nicely, whether it's you know in the offensive line with Kevin Zeitler and you know and Jonathan Simpson, by the way, just has been a remarkable yeah. find, and the, the way he found his confidence and has his happy place here. But it's not just the the quality of the player on the field, not that you know, just like if not just the measurables. It's is that guy going to work with what we do? Is he going to fit into that locker room? And they, DeCosta's done a very good job of finding those guys and seeing that Jadavian Clowney was someone who was unhappy in Cleveland because they didn't treat him with the respect that he deserved. They really didn't. And, and he was not going to respond well to that. They've, they've shown him the utmost, utmost respect here in Baltimore. And his response to that has been, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. I don't care about the rare. I don't, where do you, whatever you need, I got it because they, they, they showed him that. And so the, you find it's just been a, it's been a masterclass in putting together a, a roster when you have a quarterback who is now making what he is making. And that's a, treme- a tremendous challenge. Now this all season is going to be really challenging because there are a lot of guys that you look at that you would like to keep, but you're like, how hey, you certain you're not going to keep them all. Who, who are you going to target and who do you look forward to maybe even early that you want to lock up? Long term, Kyle Hamilton, um, you know, who you say is that guy's got to be with us. He's a core guy. But I mean, you, know, you can't pay Pat Queen and Matabike what they're going to get on the open market, both of them for sure. And he would just leave you that. And what are you going to do with left tackle? There's so there's a, the, the off season is a real challenge. But what they've done to put themselves in position this year to be in this spot to nine and three to control their own destiny, they went out there the one seed. Um, then that's it's it's a, a real hat tip. Uh, to the to the construction of this roster, and they may they may not be done. I know John Harbaugh in his press conference on Monday kind of alluded to the fact they're not going to go. And even though they always look at great players, they like their tight ends. But Zacharis has been a conversation point, Pete. And at the time we're recording this, there's been no movement yet. Maybe on Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday it happens. Now John Harbaugh did say again they're they like their guys, but we have seen the coach speak aspect of things, and then a guy comes in the next day. And, you know, John Harbaugh's not going to put all his cards on the table. He's not that type of guy. Would you be opposed to seeing Zach Ertz in Baltimore, or do you think it's a, a move that they should or shouldn't make? I don't think he would be a bad addition. I don't think it's a necessary addition. You look at what Zach has done this year, and it's his longest catch is like 17 yards or something. I mean, he's he's not the guy that he was. Right. So what you would be bringing him in for what? To provide – leadership mentorship well andrews will still do that you know during the week um you I, I i don't think they need that i just don't it's you know it wouldn't be if you were to say hey that cost you anything he's going to be there fine that'd be great you know and maybe, maybe he'll be able to contribute a little and you know he'd be a good guy but they don't need to go get him i would be surprised if, if they spent any capital there given that you never know what's going to happen in the last five games you have to have an emergency move yeah, I think Isaiah Likely has stepped up enough, and, you know, they have Charlie Kohler too. But Likely, when Andrews has been out, we saw it last year. Lamar won, spread the ball around a ton when Andrews was out, and we definitely saw that in their latest game. But Likely has shown the athleticism, the flashes, and while he isn't Mark Andrews, I think that it's an important time for Lamar and Isaiah Likely to establish some chemistry. I'm not saying Zach Ertz comes in and becomes your 100% number one tight end with Andrews out. But I do think they're in a good position where they don't need to make that move. But you also mentioned left tackle. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Ronnie Stanley, Pete, because I think it's a big concern point for a lot of people. John Harbaugh is admitted, you know, hasn't been great for Ronnie right now. And I think the bye week, if if it helped anyone, it probably helped Ronnie the most. Odell is another one of those guys who's been dealing with a shoulder thing, probably helped him as well. I think the bye gate came at a perfect time. But what's your take on Ronnie Stanley? Because he really has not been the Ronnie Stanley we've been so used to in Baltimore. No, he and he really hasn't all year long, and that's where I think you know in the big picture you, you get a little concerned. And obviously he's been dinged up again. They got rolled, and again, I mean guys getting rolled up on it just 
it's it's yeah. it's like it's like recovering a fumble. It's a 50 50 proposition. I mean, it could happen on any play. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. And he has been on, you know, had some bad luck with it. And um, I, I he, he's not played very well. It's it's the stats bear it out. Your eyes bear it out. And, you know, he's he's getting beat in ways that we hadn't seen him ever get beat. And so that is concerning. Um, can he find the way back with with this extra buy or this late buy? It's possible. Certainly hope so. Um, but it's it's if he can't, you know, if he goes out and plays badly this week, I say put, and get McCarry over there and, and just you, you can't afford right now to have someone out there to try and work work it back. It's too late. You know, you, you're in a position. You have one of those years where the Mahomes Chiefs aren't the Mahomes Chiefs. You control your own destiny. Burrow gone. He's not in the picture. I mean, this is a year to find a way to get all in. Uh, it's there for the taking as much as it's going to be when you look at the quarterbacks who are in the AFC. Josh Allen's bills are, what, six and six? I mean, they're behind. You are in a great spot, and you have a healthy Lamar who is getting learning more and more about this offense each and every week. It's it's so exciting and tantalizing, and it, it can't be derailed by one guy who you're like, well, we'll just give him a little more time. Time's up. If you're not playing well, you're going to have to make a move. And you talked about the offseason. I mean, you're right. They're not going to be – this is the last year they're going to have Patrick Queen on a rookie deal and Justin Matabike on a rookie deal and Geno Stone on a rookie deal and all these guys like Clowney and Van Noy on one-year bargain contracts. They're in a great position because you're right. I think the AFC, there is a there was an opening for the Ravens to take this conference this year with the way this roster is constructed. It's not going to be constructed the same way next season. I think this is a prime opportunity for them. And I think Lamar has put himself – in at least the MVP conversation. I think a lot of people have differing opinions on who is the actual MVP at this point or not. I know there's been some concerns about the deep ball, but I think in this Todd Munkin offense, it has allowed him to be more free, have more confidence. Not that he had, he didn't have confidence in himself because he, he always trusts himself. But I think there wasn't the connection between Lamar and Greg Roman that there is now between Lamar and Todd Munkin. How would you, how would you assess what Lamar's done this year? I, his growth in the past game is just been so much fun to watch the balls that he's placing on on the boundary and over the middle the 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 arm angles the ability to throw the ball with he made a throw with he didn't even have his legs wasn't set and he like and the ball is to the right and it's dead on to nelson Aguilar and and hey nelly went out snatched and made a great catch um i don't know how there aren't any other human being that can make that throw it was ridiculous but he has the confidence to make that throw now. The the puzzling part, uh, yeah, you mentioned it. The deep ball is it's weird because it it's never been spectacular, but it's always it's been a lot better than this. Right. And it's weird, frankly, that they have been that he's so off. It's not that you're just missing by that much. He's typically overthrowing guys by 10 yards on a ball that's 40 yards in the air. And you just it's because everything else has been so good. Yeah, and it's puzzling. But if that's the if that's the problem, that and the occasional ball on a turf, you know, that that could obviously cost you a, a playoff game if you don't take care of the ball, but everything else has been just, it's been fantastic. And, you know, I don't, don't think, I mean, it's, it's fine to talk about MVP races, you know, with five games to go, but the MVP will be determined by after week seven or week 18. Cause they just, yeah. you know, I mean, that's every, and you know, now it's Brock Purdy's a favorite. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Brock Purdy was probably the 10th favorite. So we'll, <laughs> we'll wait and see, but Lamar, more importantly, Lamar is in control of the offense the team believes in him. Munkin believes in him and he believes in his players around him, trusting them in ways that we hadn't seen before. And that has made it that's there. They can go as far as he'll take them. And, and I think he can take them pretty damn far. Yeah. You know, you talk about kind of the way that he throws the ball. I mean, he's always had the arm angles, like the arm angles that he throws at have been incredible, but he's now, you know, contorting the body. You talk about some of those throws he's made. He, he's, he's a video game. He, he's incredible. And, you're right. And he, has guys, and he has guys that can do something with it when they get yeah. it that he hadn't had before. Zay Flowers is phenomenal. They, they, they got a first-round draft pick wide receiver. Correct. <laughs> Congratulations. They didn't take Quentin. You know, I'm glad. Thank you, Chargers, taking Quentin yeah, exactly. Johnson. I don't know, don't know where he was in relation to their board, but yikes. But, they, I mean, they got Zay <laughs> right, and Zay is fantastic. OBJ has his legs under him again. That took a while. And then you see how he can be explosive still. And he's going to snatch the ball. His hands are unreal. So there's your red zone, you know, third down kind of threat that 
you know, with Andrews not being there, you've got OBJ, I think, to step up and help that. And that's a that's a really key part to go there. Aguilar has, you know, been a really good number three. I mean, it, it's 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 a nice thing that it, they, they've got different choices. And Lamar is spread it out to all of them. And that's been fun to watch, too. Yeah, I remember back when they had like Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews is really their clear top two guys. It was one guy would get phased out by the defense and the other guy would have a big game and then everybody else would have it'd be one target or two targets. But we see, you know, Zay's the team leader in targets. Mark Andrews was second before going down. But it's not that big of a discrepancy when you go three, four, five, and everybody just wanted to see what can Lamar do with a full cast of weapons around him. And, you know, no disrespect to the guys he's had before, but this is the best group that he's ever had and he's showing in this offense with these receivers and I don't think this receiving core is what it is if they don't make the change from Greg Roman to Todd Munkin because wide receivers were devalued in that offense but what also is neat is that it's not like they don't run the ball Munkin is not as shy and you know he's the run game is good there's more zone out and and more outside zone for sure than what we ever saw with Roman if any with him but they're, they're they're still leading the NFL in rushing yeah. And that's that you, when you have that, and that's how you can put games away. And it's what they didn't do against Cleveland, which was some kind of maddening and frustrating. Uh, in the, when he had a two touchdown lead and couldn't get that done, they didn't run the ball. But but by and large, they have this year. When they've had, when they needed to, they've just said, "Okay, go ahead." And you have a nice combination with Gus and Keaton there now. That is, they're going to get that job done. And so you, that really, if you're just scheming to try and stop this offense, I, I mean, the headaches because of the so many varied ways they can attack you and ways that they're good, not just that they can, yeah, well, we could do that. Yeah. But can you do it well? Well, yeah, they can do it well. And that's, and that's really what I think is exciting and where it's still all trying to, they're still trying to figure out really what works best because it's all still new, but they're, they're getting there. And when it, yeah, as we see when the games we have where really is clicking and you, you, you look at, you know, what, what they did to Detroit or what they did to Seattle and you see it just really like this thing, this can be really, really special. And it's, it is fun. And, you know, we, we can talk about the inconsistencies they've had a bit on offense this year, but to their credit, in terms of yards per attempt, they are a top 10 unit in both rushing and passing second in the league in rushing and seventh in the league in passing. So despite everything that we can talk about, they start fast and then end really slowly. They're still a top 10 unit in the league here, which is incredible. But coming up in the final part of the show, we will talk a bit about where the Ravens stand right now as they look ahead to that gauntlet in the last five weeks of the year. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a lot to get to on the show. First, this episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. And I know we come to sports to escape in some of the crazy realities of real life, but we can just talk for a minute about preparing for real life. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. And this is pretty scary. And for me, I couldn't imagine a more helpless feeling than if someone I knew, someone I cared about, got really sick with a supply and chain issue, kept them from life-saving medication they needed. Thankfully, we'll be okay, though, because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to Jace Medical com and use offer code locked on and get twenty dollars off your order. We're back rounding out locked on Ravens with Pete Gilbert. I am Kevin Ostriker and Pete. This Ravens team again. I think they're going to be tested more than they ever have this year in these last five weeks. And that was part of the twenty nineteen team. Also, they were just so dominant. There weren't a ton of tests for them throughout the year. That San Francisco game in twenty nineteen was good. The Buffalo game was good. But they were stomping on teams 59 to 10 and 45 to 6. And then they had the bye. And I think when people are talking about, oh, I don't want to get, you know, the top seed, or are we going to get that again? Is it going to be the same as 2019? I think it is a little bit different when you talk about parallels between the 2019 team and this 2023 team. And that defense was still solid in 2019. It was still good. But this defense this year might not be up to the 2000 Ravens level, but. I mean, look, they're in position right now to be one of the best defenses in this team's history. Yeah, it's a very right. The defense can make up for a lot of mistakes. That's why it has allowed this offense to kind of grow through a few the occasional stumbles that they've had. And the defense, like, 
We got it. 15.6 points per game. We, we, we'll, t- we'll take care of you in that regard. And, you know, the, the fact that you have Roquan and PQ playing together the way they have is really – that's been so much fun to watch because, I mean, I, I give Patrick Queen so much credit for just saying, fine, this is the situation. Okay, I'm going to go and ball out, and I'm going to work with the guy who I wish – I feel like that should be my contract. I'm going to work with him. And no better example than the way that the selflessness with which they play – on the the how they have consistently in the inside linebackers coming in on blitzing, taking linemen out to open up lanes for other pass rushers. I mean, Queen actually gave up a sack because he right. didn't realize how free he was going to come last week. Um, but I mean, or two weeks ago. But that's what he—they're willing to do that, and that's just—I I think that's really cool. Uh, that's when you talk about buying great teams. If you're going to be a championship team, you have to have players to be ready to sacrifice and buy in and just. Go aboard. They have that in spades. They also have learned. They went through that 2019 season, that 12 game win streak. And they, I've had multiple players from that team tell me they absolutely thought they were already in the AFC title game, already going to the Super Bowl. It was, they, nobody had really, you know, nobody could stop them. They really believed that they overlooked and didn't properly prepare for Tennessee mentally. And it's, and then they showed, well, they've learned that. And John Harbaugh learned that. And the way he'll approach, if they have a buy, what that, you know, how he'll approach it will be different, no doubt, than he did in 2019. So you get that you get that scar tissue a little bit, and that's and that's the good kind to now to help you at this point. 2011, they had the scar tissue of the 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 dropped pass and the missed kick, came back the next year and got the job done. Um, going through that sometimes it just it can make you stronger. And they have, I think, the right kind of group to to make sure those kinds of mistakes don't happen again if they are in that position. But it will be hard to get there because they, again, we they haven't played their best te- teams yet. They haven't had their toughest tests. We're going to see them in, uh, you know, four next four weeks. I, I, Pittsburgh sucks. I, I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> I don't know how they've ever gotten to even seven wins. Uh, the Ravens uh, dropped 25 passes and lost. Again. It just, they're not, I'm not worried about Pittsburgh if it comes down to that. But the other four uh, will be a really good challenge. No, I, I'm with you. I, that Pittsburgh game still leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Just ha- how it went. Just drop after drop. It, it, it's again, they've been, I think they have, I can't remember the exact stats, but I think half of their drops or more than half of their drops came in that one game. They haven't really dropped passes this no, year. No, they've been great all year not doing that. That's what was so <laughs> confounding on that day. They did, it was just, a, for whatever reason, a lack of focus and concentration. Um, yeah. it, was, it was maddening. It was brutal. And I agree with you where sometimes you have to learn what it means to fail first before you go and you can have that success. And I think they know based off what you just said there that they can't overlook anybody because that Tennessee team was not given a shot in their wild card game, right. let alone the divisional game. And then they make to the championship that year. So if the Pats huge. had come to town that week, I think they maybe would have had a little different yeah. approach. They, the respect for Tom Brady would have, yeah. they probably would have beat that team. And yeah, but didn't. Yeah, it happened how it happened. And, you know, hopefully for the better, hopefully they learn from it and they can make something happen this year. But you talk about the AFC, Pete, and the Ravens right now, they're in a tie for the top spot in the AFC. Obviously, tiebreakers have a part to play and where they're actually they're actually ranked with that. But it seems like the top four, you know, no order here is Baltimore, Miami, Jacksonville and Kansas City, Kansas City with that loss against the Packers in it was a sensational game, less than sensational officiating down the stretch, but I don't know where you kind of put, because the NFC has a couple of teams, you know, 49ers, Philadelphia, Dallas, which are going to be tough if the Ravens get to the Super Bowl. But are, are you scared of any team? If you're the Ravens, I know the Ravens have a belief in that locker room and themselves, they don't fear anybody, but for you, Pete, is there a team that you think matches up really well with the Ravens that kind of goes toe to toe with them? Or do you think the Baltimore is established Hey, they're the team to beat here. Well, I, I mean, do you mean just in the AFC or overall? Uh, in the AFC, yeah. So Kansas City has a better defense clearly than they've had ever since, in terms of the Patrick Mahomes era. So that 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 mitigates a little bit. But I think that they, I think defensively, they would do enough um, to 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 keep that group in check. They, I, I think they right now match up de- as well as they have with Kansas City, and they've played them well. By and large, right? Everything you know, since Lamar got there, they, you know, they've had, you know, should have won in in twenty eighteen, and uh, you know, did get them in twenty twenty. Um, they're they can do they they can do that. 
Uh, otherwise, the AFC Jacksonville, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not sold on them. Miami is is has been a paper tiger, mm-hmm. but gosh, if it's like if they get it right, they they get it right as well as anybody. And so their you know their potential is off the charts. But it's weird how they just you know against better teams it hasn't come together. So I'm not sure. Um, there's nobody in the AFC that scares that the Rams look at him like, nah, I don't know if we can get it again. They certainly are like, we can be any of them in the NFC. I think San Fran is the best. I think they're the best team in the NFL when they have their guys, when they have Debo and McCaffrey and IU and Kittle, they're all healthy and Trent Williams out there. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's just, I mean, you score six touchdowns in a row in Philly. Um, yeah, they 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 are. I think they're the best team if they're all there. But you know, whether you know, there's a lot of time between now and then. So we'll yeah. you got to wait and see, and we'll and we'll get a good taste of it Christmas night. Um, you go see how they do match up with them, and that's and gets a what a tall order to go out there that late in the season on a Monday night. Uh, you know, it's that that will be a tough one. But you know, if they go toe to toe with them, then even if they don't win, but you know, like no, we. We stopped you enough. We scored on you enough to say we're, we're here. That's I think that's the message you need to send that, that you can go and physically battle with them. And I, you know, like I said, they didn't, they did it 19, uh, you know, beating them 20 to 17, that a great game in the rain uh, when they said Lamar can't win in weather conditions like this. Yeah. And they went ahead and did it. So that'd be a fun one, but I think the Niners are the best team in the NFL. Yeah. They, they have one heck of a roster. I'll, I'll definitely say that, but that let, let's take it down to the division level. I think, Again, Cincinnati's so far out of this at this point with Burrow being done and their conference and divisional records are just abysmal. I'm not even really counting them anymore. Cleveland, Joe Flacco did kind of his thing on Sunday, now through the interception, and it's kind of still a raven at heart for a lot of people. But I know John Harbaugh talked a bit about it as well. And then Pittsburgh, I just – I don't see how the Ravens lose to him again after what happened in Pittsburgh. It was just brutal. Are, are you going as far as to hand the division to Baltimore – right now or do you just want to wait and see it would be it would take something catastrophic for the ravens not to win the afc north this year you got the, you have a two game lead with five to go um i i just and you just look at what the other teams are dealing with i mean lamar's the only starting quarterback left in the afc north which is quite ironic <laughs> given what we've come to know the last couple of years and I, yeah i just i mean I, I i did really enjoy watching joe yesterday on on Sunday, the way he, hey, he said he slung it great. He looked yeah. fresh. His arm was lively. You know, one one bad decision cost him, but he threw a lot of great balls and made a lot of good decisions, and it was fun. Yeah, I couldn't help but you didn't root for Joe. I, didn't, I know John said he certainly wouldn't, but I'm like, hey, I was rooting for Joe. I thought that was great. Um, I you really is. I was sitting there watching with Keith Mills. And we're saying, yeah, Joe, play great, but but go ahead and lose. Right. And and you know what? Uh, well done. Well done in that regard. And Pittsburgh's going to have Mitch Trubisky going with the Patriots and what the over in that is the lowest in like a decade or something. It's, it's, it's bad. The over under <laughs> number. Oh, that's going to be a Thursday night game. They, the th- I can't, I'm just trying to envision Al Michaels for this one. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to be here. It's going to be, it's going to be spectacularly awful. I just, I, it's the car crash. I can't not watch on Thursday, but uh now, I, I, yeah, it would. I don't know how the Ravens don't win the AFC North, which means you know they'll be have they will have a home playoff game, and that's and you hope it's at night because you watch that atmosphere that they have created at MT Bank Stadium, and a tremendous shout out to the production crew there, uh, and the what they have in their their vision for what a night game can be there, and they've really delivered upon it, and it's been it's been just fantastic. Yeah, it is an electric atmosphere, and I know fans have wanted that home playoff game for so it's been a while since they've had that home playoff game. So I'm really excited to hopefully have that back in Baltimore. And I know I just remember, Pete, the, that string of just terrible Thursday night games last year. It was like seven straight just terrible matchups, and I, I can't we imagine. We had a great one last week, so that was cool. Yeah. Was, oh, we got our one. We got, Dallas and Seattle was fantastic. That was probably that unfortunately probably was like that was too much goodness. There'll be no more the yeah. rest of the year. <laughs> they got they gotta say, all right, we, we gave the fans what they wanted. Now we go back to the regularly scheduled programming there. But Pete, yeah. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for hopping on. Tell people where they can find you and what you're working on now. So uh on the over on X at WBAL Pete, Instagram, same thing. And uh I'm not as active as I once was. I've kind of just got 
find the social media game to be a little disheartening right now. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you haven't watched before, Ravens wrap up. We do late Sunday nights after the news, after Sunday night football, DVR it if you can't stay up that late. But it's the only show that night that's, you know, that has as much time devoted to the Ravens that we do. Keith Mills and myself and uh, Joe Paparato is our producer, does a great job along with Jim Forner and Bo Harrison to shoot the games and edit for us. It's just, we get, we go as long as we want to. And we don't have an off time. We usually go, you know, there's supposed to be a half hour. We go about 35, 40 minutes. And, you know, we, we, we say what, we, what needs to be said. And it's just, it's a real joy of mine. We put a lot of work into it. I'm proud of the product. So if you haven't seen that, uh, check it out. Yeah, I definitely do endorse what Pete's saying there. It's a great show. And of course, the link to Pete's social media will be in the description down below. Pete, again, I appreciate you. Thanks so much again for hopping on. And thank you for tuning in to Locked on Ravens today. Coming up tomorrow, of course, we'll be back talking Ravens football. So be sure to stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.